Today for my interview, I will be talking to TJ Conley. TJ is a musician, writer, and producer with many musical projects, one of them being the bassist in the band Chrome Moses. TJ, thanks for sitting down and talking with me today. Hey, no problem. It's my pleasure. So I'd like to start this interview off by asking you, what were your initial influences in music? My first influences, the earliest influences I can remember, I guess like many influences in my life, came from my parents. Um, my dad's a musician, and my mom really, really likes music and plays a bit of piano. Um, and they both had a lot of music around the house. I'm old enough that I remember being young, and they had records around, and that's the first time I remember listening to, to music was their records. And luckily enough, my dad was a really big fan of the Beatles and David Bowie and Bob Marley and the Moody Blues and Boston and a bunch of great bands from the 70s and the 60s that uh, I think still are really good bands and are really cool to listen to. So my first memories of music really come from my parents when I'm being really young and just listening to them, listening to their records at the house. So do you still listen to these artists today and do they still have that strong impact on you as they initially did when you first listened to them? I do, and I think that's cool, and I think that it's really, that's a really cool uh, thing that my parents did, is they liked music, I think, that was just good music. So I think when something is good culturally or artistically, it just stands up over time, and 30 or 40 years later, you can hear how good it really was. So yeah, I still do listen to these bands a lot. I listen to Led Zeppelin a ton. You know, that was a band that my dad listened to a lot. So a lot of the bands that I listened to then, my very first memories of music, I guess you could say, yeah, I, I still do listen to them often. All right, now I'm going to take a step back. And as I recall, you said that these were records that your parents had. Now, I know there's a huge debate that vinyl is the best way to listen to music. And I would just want to know, do you think that vinyl is the way to go? Well, I do. Um, I'm a big record fan myself. When I was in college, I actually spun records. I spun uh, hip hop and break beats at college parties and stuff like that. So I'm a big fan of vinyl. I think it sounds a lot better. It's really popular right now. Um, it's really, really popular right now. So much so that uh, on the new Chrome Moses record, we have to maybe possibly wait four months to get our records in because the record pressing places are so full and they're so busy. But I, I'm a believer in it. It sounds better. Um, it just makes sense that it sounds better, and uh, I'm a fan of the sound, that old, thick, warm sound of vinyl. Uh, I really like it. Chrome Moses, when, when we're in the studio, we prefer to use old gear, so we record on tape, and we use old analog gear, which kind of lends to more of a you know older, warmer vinyl sound. So I am a big fan of vinyl. I, I like you know I like the textures, and I like the sound of it. Wait a minute. Now you said that you used to spin hip hop records but it's to my knowledge that Chrome Moses is a rock and roll band. So can you tell me about how that all works and how diverse in music really are you? I think I like all types of music. And a lot of people say I like all kinds of music. And maybe they do. And maybe some just like all kinds of music that have a drum set and a guitar in there. And maybe they don't like all kinds of music. But I really, really do like all forms of music. I'm an enormous hip-hop fan. And playing in rock and roll bands, people sometimes are surprised by that. Um, I don't know anyone my age that, that, that grew up in the era I did and was unaffected by hip-hop. I, I really came up in the time that hip-hop came up. It's about as old as I am. And when I was in high school, it was, it was taking over popular culture. And I think some people my age still never took to it, but some people my age really like it and I really like it, and I'm interested in the art form. Um, and it's just another form of music. I think it has so many redeeming qualities. I think it is so honest. I think it's true. I think it's a true form. It's a, it's a true music of people that really have something to say. And I think it was just born of necessity, people with no instruments, no lessons, a couple turntables and something to say. And I think from where it, when it started all those, you know, 30-some 30, 30 years ago, when, when hip-hop started, I don't think anyone really could have guessed at how big it would become as, as a driving force in popular culture. So yeah, I'm a big fan of hip-hop. I play rock and roll, love rock and roll, but I like hip-hop too. So currently, do you have any particular favorites that are out there nowadays? 
like like everybody, I'm a big fan of Kendrick Lamar. Um, as far as rap goes, I'm I really love to see what he's doing. It just I really really dig it. Um, you know, I came up when I was spinning records. It was kind of a cool time for rap and hip hop because it was it was Biggie and it was Jay Z and it was a lot of guys from the '90s that I think were really that was that was a kind of a cool time for the genre. Uh, the Wu Tang Clan at the time that was that was they were kind of a bigger deal maybe than they are now. But as far as modern guys, I really you know King Kendrick is the is the guy that comes to mind the most. I mean, I really like what he's doing. Obviously, his stuff sounds great. Um, but I think that he really has maybe his voice hopefully has signified a new era for hip hop that's maybe going to be a little more thoughtful and maybe kind of look at things from a third person, you know, someone looking in on, on something and writing about it as, as opposed to someone just bragging about their money, you know, or their jewelry or something like that. I mean, I'd have to agree. He, uh, he does have one unique sound. But shifting tracks, I'd like to go a little bit further back to when you were speaking about your parents being a strong influence on you musically. And you mentioned that your mom played piano and that your dad was a musician, was in a few bands. Now, we know that you're a bassist. I'd like to know, was that your first instrument that you picked up? And... Um, if not, which one was the first instrument you picked up, and how did that all come about? No, I play I play a, a bunch of instruments, which is really just a product of me playing music for a long time. Um, I played music probably since I was maybe seriously really learning the guitar, probably 12 or 13. Um, and then, just like a lot of people, when you're 17, you get into it way more. But um, the first instrument I learned was the guitar, and that was just from my dad having guitars sitting around the house. Um, and just showing me things on the acoustic guitar. And like a lot of people, that was the first instrument I learned. Uh, when I started playing in bands, I took to the bass. My father's a bass player. Um, and the bass is kind of an instrument rock and roll wise that I have grown up playing. And a lot of bands that I've played in since I was a teenager, um, I played the bass. And it's something I really enjoy. It, it's a form of, you know, it's, it's a part of rock and roll that I, I really, really like embracing. Uh, a lot of the bands that I've played in are three-piece bands. So it's just a bass player, a guitar player, and a drummer. And I think that's a great challenge, and it's a great opportunity for a bass player in rock and roll, in a rock and roll setting, to really to really express yourself and do your thing, but still kind of hold the, hold the whole core together. Uh, so I play bass. I, I play some piano and organ on, um, on some records for other people, and some of my uh, bands I was in before, some records, um, and some stuff that I've produced. I, I'll play some organ or some piano on it. I wouldn't call myself a piano player, but I can play a little piano. Um, and yeah, just all around, just learning, you know, a little bit about instruments here and there over the years, being in and out of studios and making records for, you know, maybe 10 or 11 years now I've been making records in professional studios. And, uh, you know, you learn a lot of different things about music. But the first one, yeah, was the, was the acoustic guitar, and it was my father that, that taught me it. Very cool, very cool. Now, I know you've been in many different bands, and I just would like to know, what was the first one? <laughs> the very first band I was in, real, I mean, real band where we had practices and, and, and equipment and everything, I was in seventh grade, and we were in a band called Lunacy. And, and when I was in seventh grade, this was at the time of like, like Terminator 2 came out. <laughs> and like Metallica had the Black Album and stuff. It seems like so long ago. Nirvana smells like Teen Spirit. You know that that was the, I guess that was the stuff that made me really really want to join a band at the time. But that was our first band. When we were young, and um, we played our talent show for our school, and it was it was kind of awesome, really, um, to be in seventh grade and be playing, really playing, music for, you know, your peers. I guess it was kind of cool. But that was officially the first band I was in. It was called Lunacy. <laughs> now, where'd, uh, where'd that name come from? I don't know. Back then, you had to name a band like something crazy or mean because that was like all the, I don't know, I guess we listened to a lot of like metal, heavy metal, and anthrax, and like 
bands like that. So I guess I don't know. Now, did you guys write anything yourselves, or did you? No, just I, we do probably covers? tried. We probably tried, but I don't think anything was really. I don't think I was at my peak of writing when I was in seventh grade. <laughs> Now, would you say that you're still friends with or keep in touch with these members from Lunacy? No, I, I know I see one or two of them around every once in a while. But for for years, I was in a band called The Wheels, and my buddy Jake, who was in The Wheels, was also in Lunacy with me. Uh, we were buddies since grade school, and we stayed together. We actually lived together in college, and that's kind of how we started getting another band back together and he and i played in a band called the wheels we were together for almost nine or ten years released two or three records it was it was a good band i hopefully we'll maybe play some shows again sometime but but yeah jake was in lunacy with me and he was also in uh he was also in the wheels with me so my my, my ties I, i've always played music with i've always played music with people i was friends with i've never been in a band that was like guys hired so i know a lot of people that you know they might be from out of town or something and they'll get into town and they'll throw together a band with guys they meet which is awesome but i just because of the nature of my friends and me staying in my community and staying close with people and playing music from a young age i've always just played in bands with people who are my buddies first i don't know really what it's like to play in bands long term with a group full of like people i'm not close friends with you know so music and friendship for me they're they're kind of like you know woven together that way so would you consider the wheels to be your first legitimate band i'd say i was in a band called royal jelly whenever i was you know 22 or something like that just starting to go to bars and being able to play at bars um and it was kind of similar to chrome moses it was a three-piece band we played blues rock and that's when we really started writing our own songs and getting them out there and it was a good band. It, it was We were young. We maybe didn't know as much as we should have, but I guess for that age it was okay. And it was a good band. We played for maybe three years or four years or something like that um, all around Pittsburgh. We didn't travel then. But it was a great experience because we did, we did well. Um, we would play bars and everything around town, and all of our friends were 21 or 23, so they were going to the bar anyway. So we would do okay and we throw these cool shows and they'd be pretty crowded with people and it was, it was a good experience it was my first experience making a little money from music and it was my first experience playing to crowds that weren't you know just you know a handful of people sitting there uh and it was the first time i was threatened with a lawsuit <laughs> um i guess the name had been owned by somebody else and they someone contacted us and said you guys can't use that name anymore or we're gonna sue you so it was a learning experience in a lot of ways. And I think a lot of those, the things I've learned then, you know, definitely helped me, have helped me, you know, today where I am with music now. So Royal Jelly. Royal Jelly is where it all started. Royal Jelly, I guess, yeah. So TJ, you told us when you were around 21, 22, you are finally able to start playing in bars. Now, do you have any particular stories of, like problems or issues that you had when you played when you were underage. No, the the guys the guys in my bands that sometimes they were a little bit older than me. So there was maybe one or two times early on that maybe I had to kind of get in. I wasn't quite twenty one, so maybe I had to like kind of kind of like you know just kind of sneak my way in with the band. But probably from then until now. I've probably played in th thousands of bars, and I guess you just kind of get used to it. I, I don't know, like, there's all kind of wildness that always happens because of the environment you're in. Uh, it just kind of goes with with the business. I mean, yeah, you make some money from people buying tickets, but really, people make their money from those ticket buyers buying booze. That's just a, a model that musicians and comedians and a lot of entertainers, that's just a, that's just the model of the business. So there's a lot of craziness and there's a lot of wildness, but as you get older and you do it over and over and over again, there's a lot of just, it's just, you know, it's just a, it's just something that comes along with the work, with the business. Okay, now onto your current band, I would just like to know, how did Chrome Moses come about? Well, uh, my good friend and my musical partner, Joe, 
uh, Joe Piacquadio. He and I have been playing music together for a long time. He was in Royal Jelly with me. Uh, we met when we were in high school, and we immediately bonded on a r obsessive love of music. Um, at first, it was we really we we got together on like uh, Derek and the Dominoes. There's a Derek and the Dominoes record, uh, the Layla record, you know, and we really dug on that. We dug on Clapton, and my dad had all these instruments at the house, and Joe had played a little guitar then, and we kind of got together when we were, you know, high school, the end of high school, and started throwing some songs together and things like that. Uh, and that relationship between he and I, we when we formed Royal Jelly, that... Um, kind of just matured into Chrome Moses. Um, and in, like I said, in a lot of ways, Chrome Moses is is a descendant of Royal Jelly. Uh, and you could kind of see it in, in both bands. Um, but Joey and I started Chrome Moses years ago, actually. And we never really... We were in another band at the time. And we never really got off the ground with Moses. Um, we had some a couple issues with some drummers. And uh, and Moses, you know, just kind of was a band we really liked and we wrote for, and we had some songs ready. Um, but until we found the drummer who we play with now, who's my good friend, uh, Clarence, and he had been my good friend, but he had been unavailable to play in Crow Moses. When he be, when when he was able to 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 go full time in Crow Moses, that was about three years ago. That really opened up a lot of doors for us because number one, he's a fantastic drummer. And number two, he had traveled with other bands, and, and he had been in a lot of other bands before on a lot of different levels of the business. So he knew what it was about. Um, he knew what it what it kind of was going to take to be in this band and be serious about it. And that's one of the things about a band is when you have when you have your membership, whether it's three, four, five, six people, when you have all four or five of those people really into it you can really accomplish a lot as a band. I guess you could say that for anything. Um, and, you know, if you have a band that has five people in it and three people are really digging it and really working hard, but two people are kind of one foot in, one foot out, usually that gets pretty frustrating and that's that's hard to do. So Crow Moses, um, you know, kind of our recent success in the past couple of years and just the fact that we're getting out there, we're recording records, we're touring, a lot of that has to deal with... Uh, with Clarence and us finding a drummer and finding the right person and finding the right chemistry with that person. Mm. All right. Now, it is to my knowledge that Chrome Moses and the Wheels existed at the same time. Now, I just want to know how difficult was that to juggle two bands at the same time? And have you had more than two at the same time? No, those were the two bands, and there was about a year where they were, where we were trying to, we were playing out in Moses and the Wheels, and it was really hard. It's hard enough to be in one band, because we don't, that's not how we make all of our money. We have regular day jobs, some guys have families, so one band is hard enough, and it's taxing enough on your time and your energy. So that was really, it was challenging, but it was great too, because I don't want to speak for Joey, but we've often talked about how the wheels required different musical roles for both of us than Chrome Moses. Chrome Moses is a three-piece rock band. I play bass and I sing background vocals. Um, in the wheels, I played guitar, I sang lead vocals, I played harmonica and keyboard and organ, as well as bass. So I enjoyed it musically, having two or three rehearsals a week where I would do different things. Um, musically. Sometimes I'd be playing acoustic guitar for half the practice, or I'd be playing piano or organ. And um, now I do that on my own, but it was nice doing that with the guys and doing that with a band. It, it made me, you know, it, I feel like I was perhaps a more well-rounded musician at the time. Man, that does seem like a lot of work. But now, TJ, I know that through The Wheels and Chrome Moses, you have released numerous albums as a musician. Now, would you be able to tell me about the recording process? Do you have to set everything aside? Is that your only focus? Can you just elaborate for me the recording process? We, we try to. A lot of times when I record, um, some guys record, you know, because the technology's gotten better. Some guys record themselves or they record in, in a studio that they've built, which is great. Um, I have known people that made fantastic records that way. Um, I like to record my albums with 
with the bands in a, a real studio, in a professional studio. As I mentioned before, um, I prefer an analog sound. So um, there's only a few places really in Pittsburgh that you can go and record onto two-inch tape and you know the, they have experience with it and they know what they're doing. Um, so that's part of the process. Uh, we also, we probably spend more money recording than most bands do nowadays. Uh, we don't really do any Kickstarter or any crowdfunding. We go out and we play shows and we make our money from playing shows and selling our CDs and t-shirts and things like that. So it takes a little while to save up money and when we do get around to recording, uh, the tracking phase of recording, we, we do like to we do like to lock the studio out for depending on how many songs we're trying to get down anywhere between three to ten days and um, just as a testament to to the time that we you know put into music some of the guys will use their vacation time uh, some of the guys we try to schedule it whenever their work is slow if they're seasonal workers if they're construction guys um, you know then we record in January but we do like to have several days in a row set up in the studio to track to capture the initial tracks because we can get in there we can get comfortable we can work out any kinks that happen to you know be going on and we can leave our gear set up there for you know a week and we have some time to really lay things down and you know get things where we want it all right now that we have insight on the recording process i'd like to know a little bit more about the writing process. Now, I've read a few articles about different musicians and their way of writing, and I know in particular that Ben Bridwell from Band of Horses says that he likes to be totally secluded. He likes to be out in the wilderness, away from everything and everyone. I would just like to know how much your process differs from this. I think that maybe... Maybe when I was younger, I felt something like that. Like I, I needed to be alone by myself, sitting there with the tablet to be able to write a song. But I think as you get older and you get better at songwriting, you just learn to write songs under different circumstances. Uh, a lot of times what I do is I have you know a little recorder on my phone, and when I have an idea for something, I'll play it into my phone and record it, and then see if... Um, you know, see if if something is there I like. Sometimes I give it a few days and I'll listen to it four days after I, I wrote it and say, Man, do I still like this as much as I did then? And if the answer is yes, then maybe I kind of make that into a bigger song. Sometimes songs just come to you. Sometimes a song, a whole song will come to you. They're, those are usually the best ones. But sometimes it just, that's the way it is. It just comes to you all at once where you'll have most of the lyrics, uh, you'll have the, the melody, you'll have the changes in the bridge all just come out. And that's a really cool process. I've heard different artists talk about that. I've heard Tom Petty talk about that. And I truly believe some, I think some of my songs that over the years that people have really enjoyed and they've told me over and over again um, that how much they love these songs. I think some of my songs that, that fall into that category are the ones that just, you know, people say they write themselves. Um, and sometimes that's the way it happens. But I don't know, you get older as a songwriter and you and you just get a little bit better at it. You get a little craftier and you know what it's going to take, you know, to to write that good song. The the thing on my phone about recording into my phone, I actually started doing that like kind of before smartphones. I had like a little tape recorder and I would just record ideas when they came to me into the tape recorder. I still have a few of those tapes around here somewhere. But they might have a couple good song ideas on there. I don't know. I haven't listened to them in a while. I might have to pull them out. <laughs> give, give them a listen. But uh so what what would you say does come first though the the music or the the lyrics? I, I'm always a a music first person. I, I kind of envy people that can write lyrics first and then put the music to it. But for me, I'm always a music first person because I try to maybe get some changes down and then from there, I, you know, I think a melody is one of the hardest things and one of the most important things to a good song. Um, so I, I'm always you know I'm usually almost always a music guy first and then I. I kind of mumble through some lyrics, and then I go back after the fact and, and then write the lyrics. Most of the time, I think that's how it happens. All right, that's pretty interesting. Now, I know that Crow Moses is in the process of releasing a new album, and I'd just like to know how that's going, and how is your music influenced in this album? Well, I think um, 
the, the album's going great. We we just are finishing up mixing it. It actually was we just finished. We approved the very last mixes on it, and we we love the way it sounds. Absolutely love the way it sounds. Um, I think it's a move forward for us as Chrome Moses because this is the first album we've recorded with Clarence. Our last record we had another drummer on, um, and Clarence is the drummer of Chrome Moses. He's been playing with us for years, and he's indicative to our sound. So that's the first thing. This has Clarence on it, and it is really a full Chrome Moses record, uh, and I love the way it sounds. But as far as the songs go, I think that they maybe expanded a little bit more from a the first record. You could hear the blues rock influence maybe a little more than this record. Um, but but I think the songs, they have an intensity and they have a complexity to them that it isn't just blues rock. And um, I hope that gets across to people. I really think people are going to like it, you know, but we are, we're really happy with how it's sounding so far. Would you say it's relatable to a certain sound that's out there nowadays? Uh, I don't know. It, it's hard to say because I think it sounds like us, you know, but I, I was part of crafting it from, from the very first note on. Um, but it, it, it hasn't, you know, we recorded it on tape. <clears throat> we all have, you know, tube amplifiers and we try to get the vocals to sound old and maybe a little distressed. So all those things, you know, they kind of come together where some people would hear it and maybe think it has a vintage 60s sound, you know, but like when we started the interview and we talked about vinyl, that's, we were just kind of going for that. We really like those records. We love the sound of Cream Records. Uh, we love the sound of a lot of those 60s rock bands. So, you know, we hope that that, you know, we hope that there's traces of that in there, but we also hope that it sounds like something new and something cool that people like, you know, just really want to get down to. Sounds very intriguing. So, uh, TJ, as we uh, wind down this interview, I'd just like to ask you, what are some lasting memories of music, and what keeps you doing it? You know, what is your drive with music? I don't know. I think, as far as music goes, with me, I think when I was younger, I turned to it as maybe a form of expression, or just... Maybe I would turn to it as a relief because I feel like whenever I would play, and I, I still am to this day, if I'm having like kind of a rough week with work and I'm feeling like a little bit down and I know that I have a rehearsal on Thursday night, I will feel better after that Thursday night rehearsal. And it's just something about playing music that just, it, it, it matters so much to me personally. And it doesn't matter for any reason about money or acknowledgement or anything. The, the true reason with music is that I think it really does it, it helps me out personally, just in my life, the, the expression and just being able to turn to music and being able to to let out emotion in, in that form. It's really important to me. And I think I realized that when I was younger and I maybe didn't put my finger on it. But when I was younger, you know, you just kind of find that about yourself. Um, and, and, you know, with music for me, it's just it's just part of my life. It's been part of my life since before I can remember. There's always been instruments of music around. And now I couldn't picture my life without music. So much of my life is dedicated to playing or listening to or creating music. It's just become part of me. You know, I think maybe that's true with any artist. If you do it long enough and you, you know, you learn, you learn about it and you attempt to do it and you try to become an artist yourself. I think no matter what the medium is, your life and your art, as you grow up, if you're dedicated to your art, and if you work hard at your art, your life and your art will kind of weave together to where you're just that person. There's not really a TJ, the bass player or guitar player, and then a TJ, the other thing. That's just kind of who I am. You know, musicians, that's just, you know, a lot of guys I talk to, that's how they feel about music. And... You know, that's how I feel about music. And I feel grateful. I, I honestly do feel the older I get and the more people I saw uh, I, that I've known when I was younger that were in bands and I see them now and they're no longer in bands. It makes me think and it makes me very grateful for my partners in this, that they still dedicate their time, fully dedicate them, their time. They go really hard and it makes me grateful for what they do towards the music that we make together. And I am seriously feel grateful that I'm you know, still able to go into studios and make records that people buy and that people appreciate. 
I, I, I think it's unbelievable that I can still play in front of people that get down and really dig the music. And I just feel grateful. And I, and I feel like, you know, every time that I get to make another record, I just feel so happy and, and just, just really grateful that I'm getting to do it again. That truly is awesome, man. Now, I'd like to finish this off with one more question. So, TJ, what would be some advice or inspirational words that you would have for any aspiring musicians? I think, you know, we, you, see a lot, you see a lot now with, with crowdfunding and Kickstarter, and you see a lot of young people um, going out there and, and trying to shake up some money that way. And, and that's good. And if you if they can if you can do that, and you legitimately have people that want to help you out and donate to your thing or whatever, that's fine. But my advice to to young artists is, you don't need you don't need the money to be an artist. You, you if you're an artist, you're an artist. It wasn't like Van Gogh was like I would love to paint these paintings, but I can't afford the paint. So unless someone buys me paint, I'm not going to paint these paintings. It's not like that. And in a lot of ways. If you are a young singer or if you are a young band, I think that going out and playing shows for $100 or playing just getting any money you can at first, I think it's a great experience and I think it's an important experience. So, you know, one of my points of advice for young people um, is to get out there and play and take it seriously. Your art is only going to pay you back for as seriously as you take it. If you're in it just to kind of hang out and party and you're not really putting your heart into it and you're not working hard, then you're probably not going to get paid back a lot from that. And I don't mean money-wise. I just mean in whatever other rewards your art's going to give you. I think you got to work really hard as an artist. If that's what you want to do, there's a billion people that kind of play guitar, and there's a billion people that kind of want to write songs, and there's a billion people that have a band. And if you want to, you know, you really want to do that, and it's in your heart, and, and you really feel compelled to that, you have to work very, very hard at it. And that's one of the things I think... Some people don't really see, especially with a lot of like the American Idol TV shows and stuff like that. I think people think that you just kind of mill around and, and then you wait for your big break. And I don't, you know, I, I think that the, that couldn't be more, that couldn't be further from not the way that it goes. So my advice to young people, to young artists is be true to your art, work really, really hard, and it will pay you back in one way or another the work that you put into it. A truly great message from TJ Conley. I would uh, I'd like to thank you, TJ, for, yeah. for sitting down and talking with me. Thanks for and, having uh, me. I wish you the best of luck in the future and uh, with Chrome Moses. Okay, thank you. Thank you.